¿Has mandado un reminder? Sí. Perfecto. Voy a comenzar a grabar. Good morning, everybody. Welcome for a new uh, talk in the Severo Ochoa program. Today, we will have the talk by Dr. Rebecca Garcia Lopez, and she will talk about optical interferometric studies of stars and uh, planet formation. And uh, Dr. Garcia Lopez will be properly introduced by Isabel Marquez. Yes, Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for being here in the, this in another uh, web blockum from our Severo Ochoa program. It's a pleasure for us uh, to, first of all, thank Rebecca Garcia Lopez, who is giving the talk today. Uh, for uh, having accepted our invitation for this web blockum. And uh, this is uh, an, inv an invitation that I, I'd like to extend to an in-person one for next October. Um, so um, it'll be uh, even a greater pleasure to have you in person here. Rebecca Garcia Lopez has a tenure track position at the Dublin University College, where she combines uh, research and teaching activities. She made her PhD uh, thesis at the uh, um, observatory in, in Rome, in, under the supervision of uh, Brunella Nizzini in 2009, and a thesis that was uh, devoted to studying the origin and properties of class one and class zero protostellar jets as close as possible to the source itself. Uh, then she got a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy uh, in the infrared group led by Gerd uh, Wiegelt. During this postdoc, she became an expert in optical spectral interferometry. In 2014, she moved to Dublin, first working at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, where she got uh, first a Marie Curie uh, Fellowship grant, and, and then a starting, a starting grant from the Irish Science Foundation. Both grants uh, were and still are uh, for interferometric studies of young stellar objects. And thanks to her experience in this, um, in this uh, methodology in optical interferometry, she's the PI, the, 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 the project investigation of, of the warranty time observations of the instrument uh, gravity of the VLTI. And she's also the Irish uh, representative uh, in the ESO uh, community, uh, users community. She's author of around 120 papers in peer reviewed journals uh, with more than 2000 citations and um, as you know, she will talk today about optical interferometri interferometric studies of star and planet formation. Uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Rebecca, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, optical interferometry, and hopefully you will you will like it. <clears throat> and um, uh, first of all, what I'd like to do uh, nowadays in every talk that I do is uh, to tell you that I'm uh, going to talk to you about uh, the inner disk, uh, so the inner disk in protoplanetary disks, and um, I'm, uh, I usually do that uh, because people when hear about protoplanetary disks because of the nice ALMA and also sphere images as, as the one that I'm showing here, they think that I'm going to show you beautiful images with the structure of disks. And unfortunately, this is not going to be the case. And this is because uh, in order, uh, it's not possible actually to take a, a real image uh, or a standard image of, of the inner disk uh, from my definition of inner disk. And indeed for me, uh, the inner disk is uh, also the innermost disk, so it's everything that is within 5 AU. So 5 AU is roughly distance to, to Jupiter, the equivalent in the solar system. And this region here is usually covered by the uh, uh, by the coronagraph of instruments like like a sphere. So that's why we cannot use direct imaging uh, in this in this sense. <clears throat> um, this region, however, is is very important, and actually is what I think that most of the fun happens in in the protoplanetary disks. Uh, just to give you a, a feeling about this region for, for the non-experts. Non so in this region, uh, you have uh, you have uh, parts of the uh, protoplanetary disk. Uh, so the matter flows uh, through the disk uh, onto the star following the magnetospheric accretion. Uh, at least for, for low mass stars, we are pretty sure that this is uh, the mechanism for the accretion in protoplanetary disks. 
uh, because of the uh, of the radiation from the star, the dust uh, that is in the in the disk cannot survive very close to the uh, to the central source because it will just evaporate. So we also have this region of the disk that uh, is called uh, the gaseous inner disk. I will talk about uh, these regions uh, later on in the talk. And, uh, and then at certain points in the disk, uh, you will have the dust grains will will, will uh, coagulate and, and sublimate here at this uh, in these regions that we call the sublimation front. Uh, sometimes I will also call it uh, the wall or, or, or the rim. Sorry. And um, uh, in this region also, we now believe that there are uh, strong wings that maybe somehow further up will collimate in, for, in form a jet. But uh, these winds now have uh, gained importance because new models uh, predict that they might be one of the uh, main uh, uh, mechanisms uh, to remove uh, angular momentum and thus, uh, uh, and thus um, uh, allow the accretion onto the star. Um, uh, this region is also very important because, as you can imagine, because you have these uh, accretion uh, columns and the accretion shocks, uh, lots of energy will be liberated uh, in the form of uh, UV and optical radiation. And this will affect uh, not only the inner disk, but uh, the, the wall balance of, of the full disk, actually. So I hope that I convince you that it's very important to understand what is happening in, in this uh, inner disk. Uh, and to study these tiny regions, I have this, uh, this image here and this sketch uh, from Dulemont. And what I like uh, uh, to do is to overlap to this image the uh, bin sizes of, of different interferometers. So ALMA, for instance, and then in the optical, uh, optical is called optical interferometry because of the, uh, of the optical system that, that we need to use, but it's not because it's in the optical wavelength. So we have also Matisse, that is an optical interferometer, but works in the L, M, and M band uh, gravity that works in the K band. And then you can also go to the real optical using, for instance, Chara. And what you can see, so these are the different bin sizes for the appropriate, uh, so the maximum uh, baselines and uh, maximum resolution. Uh, resolution. <clears throat> and you can see that with instruments uh, like ALMA, you cannot uh, really spatially resolve the first uh, AU of the disk because the pin size is, is too big. So we need to use uh, interferometers from the L band uh, towards shorter baselines if you want to spatially resolve uh, the inner disk. And in this talk, I will mostly uh, just talk about uh, gravity. Uh, so gravity, for those of you that do not know, is a, a beam combiner for the very large telescope interferometer in, in Paranal. And uh, it can't combine the light of uh, up to four telescopes. So it can use the four UT telescope, uh, the four eighty meters telescope, or the uh, four uh, eight meter auxiliary telescopes. Uh, sorry, 1.8 meter auxiliary telescopes. That these uh, small telescopes they can relocate, and so we are, they are preferably used for image reconstruction of, of bright sources. Uh, gravity uh, can work in single mode or in, in dual field mode. Uh, dual mode it means that you can use a uh, source uh, difference to your science target for fringe tracking, and also you can do uh, astrometric uh, measurements with uh, very high uh, precision. And it also works at different spectral resolutions. Uh, but in this talk, I will mostly show you results uh, of the high uh, resolution mode of 4000 or the low resolution mode uh, of uh, 50, uh, 50. So this is the resolution mode of the fringe tracker instrument. Uh, the limiting magnitude can be up to or down to 16 magnitudes with the uh, eight meter telescope. So now uh, we are really in uh, at a time that we can really uh, observe uh, uh, faint sources, and this will be even improved uh, more with uh, the Gravity Plus project. So I will not have time to, to talk to you about that, but uh, it will even get to, to fainter magnitudes. <clears throat> So the uh, in in this talk, as I told you, I'm uh, mostly going to present uh, the results that they, they have been uh, uh, done uh, with with gravity through the uh, quality time uh, observational program on Jan Estrella objects. And so this is a, a big uh, effort that the community is taking to do a, a statistical study of uh, young star objects uh, of uh, different masses, so from uh, T-Tauri sources to high mass uh, young star objects. 
uh, in both uh, the dust uh, emissions and uh, on the gas emission. Uh, for the gas, uh, because gravity works in the K band, so around two microns, we are tracing uh, the hot gas uh, traced by the uh, hydrogen line, the bracket gamma line, and the uh, CO uh, raw vibrational lines at 2.3 microns. So uh, maybe you are more familiar with the with the four microns uh, CO, but in this talk I'm only talking about the near infrared lines. Um, and uh, we are um, trying to, to map as many sources as we can, uh, spanning different uh, masses, as I told you, and, and also these properties, so in the sense that we are trying to study full disks and, uh, and transitional disks, so this with uh, gaps, at least gaps in the, in the dust. So the main running programs that we have with the GTO program is uh, a continuum program uh, where we study the continuum emissions in, uh, we separate it by type of object. So uh, Airbix, the Tau resources and high mass value source. Uh, the line program, as I told you, so mainly the bracket gamma and the, and the CO, uh, a statistical study for the CO, the number of sources is, is less because there are less uh, YSOs uh, emitting in, in CO. And then we have also started in uh, the last few years uh, imaging program uh, with, the, with the 80s. <clears throat> so uh, with this slide here, uh, what I want uh, uh, to show you is uh, what do we know about the inner disk or the innermost regions of protoplanetary disks and why we need uh, interferometry. Why uh, um, why standard observations, by standard I mean like photometry or high spectral resolution observations, is not enough to trace or to know uh, everything we want to know about uh, the inner disk. And I'm going to start by, by photometry and then I will move to the, to the gas studies. So with uh, photometry, uh, what we can study is the uh, spectral energy distribution of these young stellar objects. And here on the left, I'm showing you a uh, um, nice spectral uh, energy distribution or a typical spectral energy distribution of uh, intermediate mass uh, star. Uh, in this case, it's an epic. And I choose an epic because uh, in epics, there is it's much more easy to see this, uh, this near infrared pump here at uh, two microns. So uh, it was realized uh, pretty soon that uh, Airbix, but later on also Tita resources, also it is much more difficult to see this pump in Tita resources. Uh, they show this bump here at two microns. And, and uh, the curious thing about this uh, bump is that it can be very well um, modeled by a Planck function, so by a black body of around 1,500 Kelvin. And these, for people that uh, do dust, will ring a bell because this is typically the dust uh, sublimation temperature of uh, silicates and grains, uh, dust grains uh, in general. So you might wonder why we care about this uh, near infrared pump. So this near infrared pump is important because um, about uh, half of the flux in the near infrared is concentrated in this in this pump. So it has uh, almost uh, and almost all the energy within uh, one AU uh, is, is is emitted. So it produces this this pump here. So all the energy is concentrated here. So this makes a very good question to try to understand what what is generating this pump in this better energy distribution and actually early um, models so, um, optically thick uh, uh, disk models the ones that we use in the 80s early 90s they are not able to reproduce this pump and you can only reproduce it if, if you think uh, uh, that uh, you have, um, uh, if you think uh, because you, you have this Planck function at uh, 1500 Kelvin that reminds you of dust, so that you have uh, a sort of wall of dust uh, that is the responsible of this uh, near infrared pump. <clears throat> and this is because if you think that you have some sort of dust, dust uh, will dominate uh, opacities. And so uh, this will be a, a optically thick uh, dusty disk. And uh, before this optically thick dusty disk, we think that we have something that is uh, more optically thinner, maybe even optically thin. So an observer that is looking from the start towards the dusty disk will see this region like a, a sort of wall. And that's uh, where, it, where it comes the wall or, or, or the rim uh, part. So, um, so this is uh, what we think. Uh, 
just uh, derive it, for instance, for um, the, the, the modeling of the spectral array distribution. But we can tell much more using photometry. So we cannot um, tell you about where the location of this wall of this stream uh, is uh, within the disk. And uh, we, we cannot uh, extrapolate what is the shape of this uh, disk, at least easily, or uh, what is the dust composition and the temperature. And now I'm going to tell you how uh, we can infer these properties using uh, optical interferometry, because with uh, optical interferometry, especially in the K band, at two microns, we can especially resolve this, this rim here. So what uh, we have done uh, in the past, uh, from the first interferometers, like in the early uh, 2000s, uh, with IOTA, for instance, and the first generation of uh, interferometers for the VLTI, is to build uh, these uh, so-called uh, size uh, luminosity diagrams. So here I'm showing you uh, the results for the um, uh, gravity GTO program for the continuum. So the blue uh, are t tau resources and uh, gray are uh, epic uh, sources. So you see here in the x-axis the stellar luminosity. And you can see that uh, these sources, so if you plot sizes in the U versus the stellar luminosity, you have this very nice uh, relationship between the size and the luminosity that actually goes as the square root of, of the luminosity. Then you can try to find models that fit uh, this relationship. And uh, actually what you see is that again, fully optically thick disks uh, do not fit this, this trend. And what you have to do in order to fit this data is you need an optically uh, thin inner disk uh, followed it by an optically thick disk uh, with, the, with this ring. Because the location of, of, the, of the ring, uh, of the, this uh, wall, will scale as the uh, uh, square root of the stellar luminosity. Um, and actually, we see that if you fit different models for different uh, uh, grain properties, because the location of the rim uh, will be uh, correlated with the compositions and the size of the dust grains and, and the temperature of these dust grains, then you see, and well, in other relative uh, transfer effects, like for instance, how the uh, um, um, light from the star will hit uh, the wall. But uh, in general, you see that, uh, so these are the different uh, models for different dust grain size and compositions and different temperatures. You see that on average, uh, the models fit very well uh, the trends that we observe with an uh, average temperature of around uh, 1,500 Kelvin. So again, a, a standard, a standard silicates. Uh, but uh, apart from this, uh, okay, ah, one thing that I forgot. So this work, this straight line worked very well for uh, t tau resources and epic sources of a spectral type A, but when you move towards more um, uh, luminous sources like uh, type B, what we observe uh, here, I'm showing uh, this, uh, this plot for Marcos and Arenal Piper 2021, you see that uh, the B type stars, they are under luminous. So this, what we think uh, uh, it might be telling us is that uh, maybe the inner disk of uh, B-type stars is, is optically thick. It, it, it might be that. There are other possibilities, but this is uh, one of those. So <clears throat> apart from this, what, what else can tell you uh, interferometry about the inner disk? We can not um, tell you more. But for that, I need uh, you to introduce uh, the closure phase. Uh, that is something that I really get uh, in optical interferometry, is these closure phases. So you get this uh, so-called closure phase when you have an interferometer with at least uh, three telescopes. And I'm going to spare you all the mathematics and uh, all the derivation of this. But just uh, uh, believe me when I tell you that this closure phase will give you is an idea of the uh, uh, symmetry of your object. So for that, I, I brought this, uh, this uh, sketch from the uh, Dulemon uh, review, uh, where uh, you have uh, different examples of how it might look uh, uh, the rim in these protoplanetary disks for a vertical rim, so a very sharp vertical rim, and a rim that it has a very round uh, structure. Okay, And you see that uh, the brightness distributions of these rims in the plane of the sky will look very different. So if you have a very inclined disk, so if you have zero degrees, the, the disk is face on. If you have 90 degrees, it's edge on. So if you have a pretty um, 
incline this with a vertical wall, you see that this uh, brightness distribution in the plane of the sky will be very, very asymmetric. Okay, <clears throat> and so uh, in this case, you will have a very strong closure phase. If you have a round rim uh, that is not very inclined, then uh, what it means is that your closure phase will be uh, close to zero. So what do we observe with uh, our surveys? Uh, so with both uh, Pioneer in the H-band and Gravity now in the K-band, what we observe is that we do not find very strong closure phase uh, signature in, in our objects. So the <clears throat> closure phase uh, of, uh, of our objects is uh, around a few tenths of degrees, 10 degrees, something like that. So this is indicative of very smooth uh, ring uh, morphologies. Um, and uh, usually our disks in the, in the K-band and also in the H-band, they can be uh, modeled by uh, ring uh, shape morphologies that are very wide. So they are, these rings sometimes are so wide that you cannot distinguish them from, from a Gaussian distribution, for instance. Now there have been also efforts to start uh, image reconstruction, uh, reconstructing the, the RIM, so the K-band uh, or H-band emission of uh, YSOs. And what you can see is that we observe uh, uh, different uh, morphologies that maybe they, they resemble the different morphologies that you can observe at, uh, at uh, longer wavelengths. Of course, these RIMs are very, very close and uh, image reconstruction in the optical is not as um, <clears throat> accurate and, and, and some well established at, as radio interferometry uh, imaging, but we will get there with time, I guess. <clears throat> so, okay, we know that we have a rim. Uh, we know that uh, it looks like, uh, like a smooth. Uh, what else can we do with uh, Image uh, with uh, optical interferometry. Well, uh, uh, one thing uh, that uh, we know already from uh, 2005 uh, with the paper, famous paper of Iselanata, uh, is that we do not actually expect from the theoretical, theoretical point of view that the rims are vertical. Okay, we we always thought uh, already from the beginning that it has to be rounded, and this is because the uh, evaporation temperature of the of the dust grains depends also on the uh, density of the gas. So what it means is that when you move from the inner disk vertical towards the surface of the disk, for instance, moving up, you will not have a single uh, um, evaporation temperature for the dust grains, but you it will change because it will change the, the density within the disk will change as well. Uh, and so you expect that these rims will be rounded. How rounded they will be? So what is this uh, dependence uh, of the um, of the shape uh, with the height about the disk uh, depends on the composition again and on the uh, grain size. And uh, as I will show you now in the next slide, uh, this is this is uh, difficult uh, to uh, to separate uh, these two things: the location of the rim and the dust composition. So, for instance, here this epsilon uh, 0.08 uh, means that you have mainly grains that are very small in size of 0.1 uh, micron, mainly silicates. Um, when you have epsilons that are very close to one, this is mainly that you are using big grains, so they are mainly uh, optically thick. So, <clears throat> uh, from our uh, observations, as I show you by uh, by fitting this uh, um, um, by fitting the uh, visibilities actually uh, and the fluxes, uh, you can uh, estimate what is the temperature of uh, of the dust that you have at the location of the rim, so where the uh, K-band continuum peaks. And uh, for our air example. Uh, we see uh, that this uh, temperature, uh, the average temperature of the sample, is consistent with the uh, uh, dust sublimation temperature of silicate. So we have a temperature of around uh, 1,500 Kelvin. Then there are uh, variations, of course, as in everything. But you do not expect to have temperatures higher than uh, 1,700 Kelvin, something like that, because this is carbonaceous grains. So here on the right, uh, that is the uh, paper from uh, Lucia Klagman and started also from her thesis. Uh, what well, you can see uh, here is uh, she tried uh, to do uh, many radiative transfer modelings of uh, including dust, uh, different dust species, different uh, dust compositions and sizes. 
and uh, she plots uh, the distance at which you usually find uh, the dust sublimation radius for uh, Pioneer and also for, for the gravity, so in the H and the K bunch. So this in blue is shaded is the average, uh, this the rim uh, position for our sample. And in the Y axis, you have different uh, grains uh, sizes and different uh, ion compositions. So olivines, e corundiums, uh, phosphorites, uh, irons, and uh, all the mixings that you can imagine and also different grain sizes and what you can see is that unfortunately the uh, grain composition and the grain size and the location of, of the rim is uh, degenerate so you can find uh, many different combinations of dust grains you can put harder uh, grains uh, with iron and uh, phosphorites and uh, make it uh, uh, go uh, inner uh, with the smaller sizes or you can choose to just put more volatile uh, species make the dust grains uh, bigger and put them uh, a little bit further but uh, you see that in the region where we find our uh, rim positions you can have many combinations of, of different grains and, and, and sizes so it's very difficult actually to to get an exact uh, grain size and, and composition <clears throat> so this is uh, just something that we can do and then you can try to um, make a more precise relative transfer modeling um, fortunately as i told you at the beginning now uh, we are starting to get uh, good uh, images of of the inner disk and and here i'm showing you some images made by by joel uh, sanchez bermudez uh, using uh, both gravity and, and pioneer so um, one thing that we presently discovered in the in the few uh, years uh, during our gt observations is that when we started to try to do Imagine of the uh, inner disk, uh, we realized that the inner rim, uh, so the K-band emissions in the K in, in with gravity, was very variable. And uh, and uh, in this case, this is HD163296, is a famous uh, VKE star. <clears throat> uh, we were fortunate enough uh, to complete uh, a good uh, UV coverage in 2018 and 2019 that allowed us uh, to see that we have these uh, asymmetries in the in the inner disk just to give you an idea this asymmetry is at two milliseconds, seconds so it's uh, at around 0.2 au from the central source really close to the source uh, and so these rims are not uh, as smooth as we thought uh, they have these bumps these, these asymmetries that we are not sure yet what they are but uh, what we were able to do uh, uh, reconstructed images at different epochs is to see that these asymmetries are stable at least in this case, and uh, we believe uh, they rotate uh, around uh, the central source, uh, most likely at, at Kriperian velocity. So because, as I told you, uh, image reconstruction in the optical is not as well established as, uh, as in radio, we also have problems with, with UV coverage because of the small number of telescopes. Uh, we also reconstructed uh, data um, from Pioneer to see that we also uh, were able to, to recover uh, the position uh, or the presence of this asymmetry also with a different instrument and different uh, uh, wavelength. And it's also consistent with uh, Matisse observations in the, in the L band. They also recover the, the asymmetry in the inner disk. So we are pretty sure that this asymmetry is, is real. And now we are monitoring it to try to follow it. Uh, so what we can say is that this is the first stable and rotating asymmetry ever detected within only 0.2 AU uh, from the source. Uh, we, uh, we cannot do um, a complete analysis of, of, of this uh, blob, this asymmetry, but from just a very simple uh, study of, of the colors, uh, we know that it has a temperature again between around uh, 1500 kelvin it's a stable uh, in uh, several years and uh, it is this most likely uh, a dusty feature so we believe it might be like a vortex uh, a disk warp or a dust cloud maybe made of refractory grains because it has to survive pretty close to, to the source or, or maybe located a little bit uh, above uh, the mid plane of the disk uh, we are still following up uh, these objects and, and trying to, to get more images of, of in, the, in the continuum. 
Uh, and now I'm going to move uh, to the uh, gas components. Uh, I always talk a lot about the dust, uh, but I'm more expert on uh, spectroscopy and so on the on the uh, gas continuum. Uh, sorry, on the gas emission. And uh, in particular, as I told you at the beginning, I mainly talk about the uh, bracket gamma line and a little bit about the CO per ton emission at 2.3 microns. And uh, just to let you know, I'm not a masochist. I'm not using the hydrogen lines because I love them. It's because it's the only line that I have in the, in the K-band. Um, I would love to be able to, to use forbidden lines, but I have to live with the with the uh, bracket gamma line. Uh, for the bracket gamma line, uh, we are not sure what it's tracing. So it might be that it traces the accretion columns, uh, MHD winds uh, at the inner region of the disk, uh, photoevaporative winds, the three things together, or depending on the source or the evolution of the source, uh, it will trace different things. For the C overtone emission, already from a high uh, spectral resolution uh, observations from Najita, for instance, and other people, we believe that it trace uh, the gaseous disk and the uh, in the innermost regions of, of the of the uh, of the gaseous disk. <clears throat> So here I'm uh, showing you one of our first results of the uh, CO emissions in the one Arabic star. So here you can see the gravity spectrum. Uh, so you can see one, two, three, four, even maybe five uh, bump heads of the CO emission at uh, 2.3 microns. Um, and then uh, I'm showing you uh, visibilities and some differential phases and uh, do not worry, I tell you what it means, uh, but uh, in, in, in very easily, so no mathematical derivation, nothing else. So uh, here you can see just the value of these continuum visibilities is very high. So the visibilities are normalized. When the visibility is one, it means that you are not resolving your, your, your source. It's like a point source. When uh, they are uh, zero, uh, what it means is that uh, you are fully resolving your, your source. So in this case, the continuum is very small, but you can see, uh, maybe not very clearly, but I promise you that are there is uh, we have these uh, little bumps at the position of the line. And what it means is that the gas that is emitting this CO is more compact than the uh, than the uh, dust that is emitting the, the continuum or, uh, or the or the K-band continuum, better said. Um, so in this case, what it means is that the uh, CO is being emitted uh, within the dust sublimation radius. So it's emitted within the fully gaseous disk um, within that wall that I showed you before. And we were very surprised about that because this is a molecule. And even if the CO is, uh, can be self-shielding, uh, we were amazed that, that it's able to survive uh, so close to the source, uh, yes, in Eric star. Um, apart from the visibilities, we can also get information about the differential phases. So the differential phases are just uh, the, uh, the displacement of the photocenter of the line with respect to the continuum. So it, it, for those that is more, they are more uh, familiar with the spectroscopy, it's like a spectrostrometric signal. Okay? And, and you see that we have these S-shaped uh, characteristic signs. That's what it means is, is that uh, it's a hint of, of, of gas uh, in rotation uh, around uh, the central uh, source. So interpre to interpret our results that we have many epochs in, in these objects, what we did is uh, to uh, build um, a LTA uh, model of uh, a CO disk in Kleberian rotation and then try to fit uh, our data yes, uh, with this model. Uh, I just have to warn you that uh, this LT model is very simple, but we do not have anything else. And in uh, every talk that I'm giving now, I'm just uh, urging uh, theoreticians to please uh, give us a detailed model of the dust free gas. So there are no uh, complex models of uh, the inner disk uh, without the contribution of dust. So there are different codes uh, that they can decrease uh, the dust content to, to a maximum, but they, they will always have dust. So what we need is a proper modeling, uh, a proper thermochemistry model of, of, the, of the inner disk and we lack it. The only models that we have and to whom we can compare uh, uh, the models from uh, Mozzarella 2004, that they are, yeah, they just use the mean uh, 
uh, opacities and LTE, and these we believe might not be the best approximation from, for, a, for a disk uh, atmosphere, and indeed they predict uh, uh, forest of lines, uh, especially water, and, and a lot of CO that we usually do not detect. So very few sources have uh, CO and, uh, and water. Uh, but in any case, just doing the best that we can do, uh, even knowing that uh, we have a lot of limitations and that these models will only give you a general idea of the conditions of the inner disk, we can say uh, we can uh, use this, uh, our very simple LT model, so it's even simpler than the model from, uh, from Mozzarella, that, uh, that we can fit our, our results using a very, very um, uh, a small disk actually with only a, a very thin ring model in LTE and in Kleperian rotation, we can fit, fit our results and so we we feel that uh, the emission comes very really very close from the from the source at around 0.1 AU uh, from uh, very high temperatures so for warm very warm uh, uh, gas uh, even at the limit of the uh, dissociation of the of the molecule and also dense gas so this is uh, co colon densities are around uh, 10 to the 21 10 to the 22 and uh, i'm showing you 51 off but we have other other sources as well uh, that uh, have uh, similar results to, to this one uh, the studies of this year are especially important, we believe, for the study of high mass YSOs because we have very few uh, evolutionary models of uh, massive stars and uh, actually we are not even sure what, how it's made, uh, the central star in these objects. So here I'm also showing you uh, results from gravity. Uh, again, uh, uh, using the CO at 2.3 microns of high mass YSO, we show visibility. So again, the visibility is increased um, uh, within the CO bank head. So uh, indicating that the CO is again emitted within the, the dust sublimation radius. We also have differential phases and some closure phases. I'm going to skip the closure phase, but just doing uh, a similar um, study uh, to the one that we did for, for 51 off, uh, we uh, derive again that the CO comes from a very warm gas, uh, high column densities again, so CO column densities of the order of uh, 10 to the 20. And uh, because uh, we are especially resolving the, the CO emissions, uh, we can then constrain the mass of the central source, assuming that the that the CO is rotating in, at Keplerian velocity. And so for, for these objects, uh, uh, we derive it a mass of the central uh, source of around uh, 15 uh, solar masses. So we think that this is uh, very promising for the study of uh, high mass uh, young stellar objects. And we keep um, doing these sorts of studies and this type of studies and uh, increasing our sample of high mass uh, young stellar objects. And uh, what about uh, uh, the black gamma um, statistical survey? So here I'm going mostly um, uh, to talk to you about the big sample. We have already submitted uh, uh, or about to submit a, a paper as well on the on the TITA resources uh, of the sample. But I'm mainly talking uh, to you today about the epic sample because it's the one that I'm doing uh, as the uh, uh, as the main PI for, for, for this uh, part of the survey. Um, so as I told you, we are not sure what this line is it's really tracing. So it might be accretion uh, or some sort uh, of winds. And, and, and one of the objectives was indeed to try to understand where this line is coming from to then get constrained about the physical processes, what is happening in the, in the inner disk, uh, whether they, we have uh, MHD winds uh, or we do not see them or we can trace the accretion or maybe some photovoltaic winds. <clears throat> so uh, again, here I'm just showing you some typical uh, results on how the gravity data look. Uh, this is for single single shots, but we have uh, multiple shots for 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 each short uh, for each, uh, each shot to get uh, um, as much uh, a complete UV coverage as we can. So we see that we have uh, these triangle shaped uh, brachygamma sources. Uh, so this is the spectrum in most of our uh, epic sources. Sometimes uh, we can see double peak line profiles, but there are very few sources that show double peak line profiles. Also, because the spectral resolution of gravity, unfortunately, is only 4,000. Uh, 
And then uh, we have uh, for each epoch uh, and for each shot, we have uh, six uh, baselines because we have four telescopes. And what you can see again is that uh, we have the continuum emission. And then when you get to the line, you have these uh, visibilities that increase. So indicating again that uh, the uh, gas that is emitting the line is more compact than the uh, gas uh, dust that is emitting the continuum. Uh, so the bracket gamma line in, in all our sources, uh, it is emitted within the dust uh, sublimation radius. We have around uh, uh, 26 sources with bracket gamma, and at the end we had to reduce it to around 16, something like that, sources, where we have a good six signal, and for all of them, and the uh, bracket gamma line is more compact than the continuum. Then we also have uh, signals on the uh, differential phases that also help you to understand what is the origin uh, of this line, where it comes from, and uh, some uh, closure phases as well, sometimes. Um, so that it gives you an idea about uh, how symmetric is the source. Um, and uh, okay, let me move and explain you how, how we analyze the, the bracket gamma. Uh, we do also this for, for all the lines actually. <clears throat> So uh, in this plot, what I'm showing you is just a plot uh, of the size of the bracket gamma uh, over the size of the continuum and uh, for different uh, stellar, uh, just expressed as a function of the stellar luminosity. I'm not implying that uh, I'm uh, uh, assuming that there will be a, a, a relationship between the size of the bracket gamma and the size in the lumin stellar luminosity as for the continuum. I do not expect any relationship and indeed uh, it's pretty spread. Uh, actually, the only relationship that I see if I will show you the full sample is just the dependence on the distance with the luminosity. But uh, this plot here, it just, uh, it just indicates uh, that uh, the size of the bracket gamma line is, is always smaller than the size of the continuum for, for all the sources. Um, then uh, what we do is that uh, we derive a size for, for the bracket gamma line. And then uh, I, what I do is, uh, well, actually, before deriving the size, what I plot is the uh, uh, visibilities of the line. So I subtract the contribution of the continuum from the line, and then I plot it as a function of the baseline length. And I get with this sort of, uh, of plot. Uh, where I try uh, then to get a fit and estimate the size. But uh, with this uh, plot, uh, what I want you to, uh, to, to see is that uh, we have um, that the size of the bracket gamma line is really small. So you see here that the visibility, this is one. So this means that uh, it's like a point source. I'm not resolving anything. And, uh, and then it goes down to a plateau here around 0.7. And this is typical of uh, mostly all of our sources. So you see that the black gamma has a component for um, a small baseline. So this is uh, for uh, larger spatial scales, where you see that we are resolving the components. And uh, for other, uh, for the small spatial scales, we are not resolving because we get to this plateau. So there is a limit where we can say, OK, this thing is smaller. We can get an upper limit for the size, but, but nothing else. I, can, I cannot go down in size. So uh, if uh, I, I, I called uh, uh, the component that I am able to resolve, uh, the resolve bracket gamma component, and then I have another component that I cannot resolve, where I only can give uh, an upper limit for the size, and I call it the unresolved component. What it is very interesting is that the flux contribution uh, of the resolve and the uh, unresolved component is 50-50. So around half of the of the flux of the bracket gamma comes from an unresolved component that it has a typical size of around five stellar radii, so as upper limit. And then uh, the resolved component has a typical size of a around 20 stellar radii for, for our Arabic, uh, Arabic sample. So uh, I was uh, first wondering whether, what these resolved components might be, where it comes from. And uh, I started to compare it with different radii, uh, typical radii like the corrotation radius. So if you compare the size of the uh, bracket gamma line with the corrotation radius, you see that this uh, bracket gamma line is around six, uh, eight times uh, the corrotation radius. So it's uh, emitted from a region that is larger than the corrotation radius, uh, just the resolved component. The unresolved component, of course, is, is much smaller. I don't know where it comes from. 
I have some ideas, but I will tell you later. Um, so, uh, so then uh, we thought maybe is this is tracing a wind, uh, an MHD wind or a photoevaporative wind. So we started with the photoevaporative wind and the uh, uh, the emission from photoevaporative winds. Um, uh, so these are uh, a bound, a unbounded uh, gas uh, at the outer regions of the disk. Um, the emission from photoevaporative uh, disk peaks at uh, the so-called gravitational radius. And uh, we know from uh, different modeling, uh, so you can uh, model these photoevaporative winds adding uh, more extreme ultraviolet or fire ultraviolet, X-rays, there are different flavors. Uh, but uh, uh, usually these photoevaporative winds peaks at around 0.2, 0.5 gravitational radius. Um, and for uh, a typical herbic star of around two solar masses, the mass loss rate will peak even further. So uh, we'll peak at around two AU uh, for extreme ultraviolet and even farther away from far ultraviolet or the X-ray radius. What we see from our sample is uh, that the bracket gamma is always far well below uh, the typical gravitational radius. So we do not expect this to be a photoevaporated wind uh, for this uh, for this reason. So that main of the of the resolved component. Uh, so we believe that uh, mainly is, is not coming from a photoevaporated wind. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, because uh, also this resolved component is too big for uh, for Erbix, Erbix have a very small uh, magnetic field. So the truncation radius, if they have magnetospheric accretion, will come uh, very close to the to the central source. This uh, resolved component cannot be due either to to accretion, uh, and uh, because it's uh, too close, uh, it, it cannot be a photoevaporative wind. So uh, we are not sure whether it might be uh, an MHD wind or just uh, the uh, disk atmosphere, uh, the disk atmosphere. So just uh, some some atmosphere of the disk that is uh, uh, emitting in in black gamma. Um, we have also some information from the differential phases, as I told you. So because the this uh, this signature here, so you can also derive uh, the differential phase of the line just removing the continuum contribution. So you see better uh, the displacement of the line with respect to the continuum. And uh, I've uh, used that to estimate uh, the line displacement at different spectral channels and also to compute uh, position velocity diagrams because I'm, uh, my background is spectroscopy and I come from jets and I see much better, understand much better a position velocity diagram than just at displacement as, as they use in, in optical interferometry. Um, but when we observe uh, the differential phases for the source where we have a, a differential phase signature, what we see is that uh, we get much more closer to the source. So what we are sampling is that uh, unresolved component that I could not uh, sample with the visibilities. I can get some clues uh, using the, the, the line displacements because that gives me much more uh, spectrostrometric resolution. And uh, what I see is that we have two types of, of, of sources, let's call it like that. One when I can um, um, spectrostrometric resolve uh, the, uh, the bracket gamma line, like in this case here on the right, or where I cannot spectrostrometric resolve it because it's too small. And uh, But in any case, you see that even when I do not, I cannot spectrostrometric resolve it, I see this S-shaped profile that is typical of, of gas in rotation. I do not see why it cannot be Keplerian. And when I resolve it, what I have done is uh, to fit uh, just a Keplerian pattern. So this is this uh, dark blue and dark red uh, using the inclination that I derive uh, from the uh, bracket gamma line using the visibilities. And you see that I, I obtained very good fitting uh, using the uh, mass uh, from the uh, from the uh, tracks and change it a little bit, but I do not need even to change it uh, any, any within the errors. It fits perfectly a Keplerian rotation pattern. So what we believe is that there is a continuum emission of the bracket gamma. So uh, the resolve and unresolved components, they are not uh, physically um, uh, different uh, processes. I, I think now that is the same thing that extends from farther in inwards. So, and I tend to believe my my 
favorite hypothesis is that this is uh, an MHD wind, even if some uh, people uh, will, will think that is the uh, uh, just the uh, atmosphere of, of the disk in, in Clipperian rotation. Uh, for some reasons, I, I like winds, but I did my thesis in jet, so I have a strong bias. Uh, so, uh, but in through, I cannot distinguish between bound and, and unbound uh, gas, unfortunately. Not yet. Uh, for that, we will need more spectral resolution, I believe. Um, so, uh, another thing that we can do, uh, and it's something that we are doing apart from the uh, interferometric project, is to use uh, the JAPS instrument at CNG to observe uh, the same sample as gravity, uh, but with JAPS uh, from the optical uh, using HAPS um, North and, and JANO instrument at CNG to uh, study the uh, um, um, line emission in, in this uh, big sample. Uh, so because JAPS cover from the uh, very blue uh, part of the spectrum to 2.3, 2.4 microns, we have a lot of hydrogen lines, uh, even forbidden lines, and with that we can get a better idea of what are the physical conditions em emitting this gas, and maybe with that we will be able to uh, distinguish between uh, this uh, atmosphere and and uh, wind emission. We are also working uh, with uh, David Hollenbach and Uma Gorty into a, a proper thermochemistry model of, of the inner disk uh, without any dust contribution. So we also hope that that will, will help to understand what are the physical conditions of, of the inner disk. But with this project here that is uh, done by, by Robin Mendel, um, one of my PhD students, is to try to constrain uh, the physical conditions of, of the inner disk. Uh, another thing that we might try to do to try to distinguish what, uh, whether it's the disk surface of, of just a wind is again image reconstruction and this is the work done by uh, Youssef, uh, he's also one of my PhD students, the, the paper is uh, about to be submitted now and we have done uh, image reconstruction in both the continuum but also the line, so this is one of the very few uh, first images uh, of the line emission. Uh, using uh, gravity. So we see that the, the line in the source uh, um, can be very well uh, reproduced or it, it fits perfectly uh, gas uh, at Keplerian rotation. Here you, you can see even the, uh, the velocity uh, again uh, with the different images at a different velocity. So this is exactly what you would expect from a disk and Keplerian rotation. Unfortunately, again, uh, without a proper model for the physical conditions of the inner disk, it's very difficult to say whether this is bound or unbound uh, gas, at least for the source. And uh, finally, I just wanted to show you some uh, very brief results in what we are doing as well with uh, the Tau resources, because for the Tau resources, we are also trying to understand and, and map uh, the magnetospheric accretion region. And this is one of uh, our results published in, in Nature about uh, TW Hydra, where we were able to spatially resolve uh, the brachycam emission in, in the source. Um, so here you see that the visibilities go down, uh, visibilities are misleading as almost everything in uh, optical interferometry, so here what is meaning is that, yeah, that the uh, line emission is bigger than the continuum emission, but in TW Hydra, because it's a transitional disk uh, and it doesn't have uh, uh, much uh, infrared excess at 2 microns, so what, is, um, what it means, so here you can see the uh, full uh, uh, spectrum from, uh, from Xuta, so what, you, what is telling you this uh, visibility is, is that uh, the black gamma is bigger than the uh, main source of the continuum, so it's bigger than the star itself, and, and that, uh, that is good. Uh, TW Hydra is very famous because it's one of the uh, uh, closest uh, sources that we have, so it's just located at around uh, 60 parsecs from Earth, and it's face-on, so it's very good if you want to trace uh, accretions, because then the accretion columns uh, will be, so you will have the maximum velocity and spectroscopy because the, the disk will be face-on. Um, uh, TW Hydras is still accreting, so it has a very uh, low accretion rate of around uh, 10 to the minus 9. Uh, so you, you expect uh, to have accretion uh, and you do not expect to have uh, strong winds, uh, uh, at least because it's not accreting, it's not a very active uh, accreting source, let's, let's say. So uh, we did the same work as we are doing for the full sample of, of uh, gravity for the Erbix and the Titauris, and we analyzed the uh, uh, the visibilities, the differential phases were, were really, really small because you expect emission to be very tiny. 
And, uh, and so when the, we derive uh, the slices, we, we were able to derive the size of this, of, of the stars to get a, a radius because the, uh, that is consistent actually with the spectroscopic studies and other modeling because the source is, is very close. We could also derive what is the, the size of the, um, of the continuum uh, emission uh, of the disk and also uh, the size of the of the line. So you can see here that the line is uh, around uh, half, uh, uh, two, oh, sorry, twice uh, smaller as, uh, as the disk uh, continuum emission. And uh, so when we got uh, this uh, this size of the black gamma, we were very surprised. It's, it's very small. It's around uh, 3.5 stellar radii. So we immediately discarded any origin as a photoevaporative wind or an MHD wind. The MHD wind was discarded because TW uh, doesn't have any evidence of of any. You know that, um, sorry? No, it was a shortcut in, in the transmission, Rebecca. So maybe the last uh, 10 seconds okay. were lost. Uh, so I was just telling you that this is the plot of the line profile of the forbidden oxygen quant, that is a single peak and very narrow. And this is consistent with the presence of a photoevaporated wind. But uh, we know, uh, indeed, TW Hydra has a famous gap of around 1 AU. So we believe that this is the photoevaporative wind that is responsible of opening this, this gap, but uh, is uh, located very far away, so uh, uh, at uh, outwards of, of 1 AU. So this cannot be what we are observing with the, with the bracket gamma line, because this is just closed. So we were able to uh, remove uh, or exclude that is a wind, MHD wind or a photoevaporative wind. So what it was reminding was the, the accretion. So fortunately, because TW is such a well studied uh, source, we have a very accurate um, uh, measurement of uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field on, on the source. So it has a, um, a dipolar component of around uh, 400, uh, 700 gauss. And uh, there is uh, a relationship uh, uh, determining uh, the mass accretion rate, the mass of the star. You can determine, and you know, the magnetic field. You can determine what is the spectral radius for the truncation radius. And when we put all the uh, uh, parameters for TW Hydra, we found that uh, the truncation radius is from three to four stellar radii. So, in very good agreement with uh, our size of the, so between uh, four and five uh, solar radii. So in very good agreement with our size of the, uh, of the bracket gamma line for TW Hydra. So in this case, we are pretty convinced that the bracket gamma in TW Hydra is just tracing the uh, magnetospheric accretion columns. And, and so this was the, the, the first uh, direct evidence uh, um, validating the uh, paradigm of uh, magnetospheric accretion in, in a TW source. And we are trying to extend uh, this, uh, this uh, study to other TW sources. And this is mainly do done by the group of uh, or the team in, in France, uh, led by uh, Jérôme Boubier and, and Karim Perot, that uh, they are part also of the uh, Gravity Consortium. And I'm uh, going to stop here because I think I bothered you a lot already. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Boring, not at all, of course. It was really nice presentation. So now the talk is open for questions and uh, uh, Rainer will manage for doing that. So Rainer, Hello. floor is yours. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Good, great. So uh, Rebecca, thank you very much for this talk. I think it was, you, you really kept it simple as you said. You did show some visibilities and some yeah, yeah. Not a boy, at least two. <laughs> but uh, really wonderful. I'm surprised. I mean, this is really having big impact now. So, so this was dense, but that was very nice, uh, very nicely explained. So let's open the floor to questions now. I had a Shine. question right then, but perhaps you cannot see my hand. 
Can you hear me? I can hear you. I cannot see your hand, but I can hear you. <laughs> and I can see you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for this very clear talk and also for sharing these very remarkable results. I have several questions, <laughs> but I only want to, to ask you a couple. Um, this is regarding the inner radius for the case of high mass young stellar objects. I think the calculation should be complex because in this case, the disk is surrounded for the maternal envelope. So you have to deal with two different densities uh, distributions, one for the disk and one, another one for the envelope. So the inner radius should depend on the polar direction. What I mean that the inner radius in the equatorial, equatorial direction should be different than the, in, for instance, the polar, because you have the envelope. I do not is the plus that you have shows uh, regarding the size and luminosity diagram, considering this issue for the case of massive protostars. Um, the plot that I saw, uh, size versus luminosity, they are epic B stars, so they are uh, more evolved uh, high mass YSOs. I do not think they, they have many uh, envelope uh, left. So you already see the central source. You see the B, the B star already in there. For the uh, real, what I call it, <laughs> I call them real high mass YSOs, <laughs> the ones that are embedded. So the, the, I think those are the ones that you are talking about. Um, we do not really see the contribution of the envelope uh, because we do not have uh, very short baselines. So we have the shorter baselines that we can get is like, I think, uh, 10 meters, 15 meters. Uh, with that, we just see the, and a halo component. So you, we see that the visibility is never go to one. And, uh, but that uh, doesn't uh, bother us to estimate uh, the size. So we, we know that, we, that, that there, is, uh, uh, there is a flux contribution that we are, not, that we are fully resolving, uh, but uh, then uh, we can go to the longest baselines and see what is the, uh, the, the size of the, uh, of the continuum emission in the, in the disk. Does it make sense? <laughs> yes, I understand that. Do that you want to constrain uh, the inner radius it is because it's where the place where planets form. But for the case of massive processor star, this should be taking into account the envelope because for yeah, it is, all it of is. our VS star that evolve weekly and has the contribution of the material. Yeah, we, we have, we taken that into account and actually we see the, that we call them halos. Uh, we, we see the halos in these sources, yes. I have my question, but perhaps I... Yeah, please ask, please ask. Yes. This is why we're discussing. Yes, regarding the TW Hydra results, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that bracket line is related with magnetospheric accretions. I am wondering if you are able to derive the mass accretion rate for this case, no? for this emblematic case. Yes, but uh, that uh, we do it uh, with other instruments because uh, with gravity, unfortunately, we do not have a flux calibration ah, of the data. I see, so I see. You, you need to get uh, simultaneous photometry. Uh, so the uh, accretions uh, studies, we do it with the shooter, for instance. Yes, it should be very important to constrain the mass. Yeah, it's, it's a problem that we have. Very relevant parameter in... It's a problem that we have uh, with this instrument, actually, because uh, you uh, you know YSOs are very variable, uh, so we have always to check with some other photometric system uh, instruments uh, to have simultaneous photometry. Or uh, we try it with gravity itself, but we were not uh, successful at the beginning. We tried to do photometry with the with the fringe, uh, with the acquisition camera of the instrument. <laughs> Okay, and my last question is uh, related with these impressive infrared asymmetries that you have shown. I don't know if you can, yeah. if you can show again the slide. I mm -hmm. am wondering if you can see also this asymmetry in radio wavelengths. For instance, ALMA, I don't know. Uh, because if we can see in different frequencies, 
frequency we can not take... alma cannot cannot reach this uh, spatial resolution so this is within the uh, arm capability so alma will just see maybe a uh, an unresolved uh, point yeah. source in, in okay. there yeah okay. i see because and uh, unfortunately with the sphere we have the coronograph uh, so it's also short sight so yeah Yes, this will correct. be just to give you an idea this will be one pixel in a sphere image okay thank you for the clarification yeah so the next questions i don't see any hands up you can also speak if not i have a very short question so you mentioned that the evaporation temperature of the dust depends on the density yes could you elaborate on that? Oh, you're asking me about the reality transfer. I'm not an expert on that. OK, um, no, I just wondered why. why. The, the wall is cool. Hmm? Yes, yes. Uh, so um, be, 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 because the, 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 there will be, oh, sorry, there will be a balance uh, between the, how do I share this again? I'm sharing. I, oh, well, I'm, I'm sharing. Um, uh, there is a, a balance uh, between the, the uh, evaporation process and the dust condensation, and uh, there will be different densities vertically in the disk because as you go move towards the mid plane, it will be more the, it will be denser than uh, the surface of the disk that you expect to have uh, lower densities. Okay, because everything will collapse towards the center. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you expect uh, that uh, at the center, um, so towards the mid plane of the disk, uh, then the densities will be higher, and it's uh, going to be harder to evaporate uh, that those rains. Okay. Also, there is a stratification in temperature vertically as well. Okay. We believe we have. All right, thank you. So we have. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's 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 good enough. Yeah. <laughs> Guillem Anglada, please. Uh, hi, thank you, Rebecca, for this nice uh, talk and and these impressive results. Uh, I, you showed some PV plots, and, and you commented that in some cases you you obtain it, uh, rotation, and sometimes sometimes you obtain Keplerian uh, a Keplerian plot. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know if I understand this correctly, but I think what you have in the in the in this edge-shaped diagram is the PV plot of a rotating ring. However, in the in the other case, you have a rotating disk. So in a disk, you you radio changes, and you you got this uh, Keplerian uh, increase of the velocity as the radius decreases. However, in a ring, you have all the material at the same radius, so you only have a projection of the distance, and you got this a uh, shape. Uh, yeah. So the, the difference is not in the in the in the physics, but in in the geometry of the of the. Yes, object, but this is, yes. Uh, so this is complicated. I tried to spare you this uh, hours of uh, discussions uh, with <laughs> with my collaborators, with Antonio Lanata especially. Um, this is how the interferometer sees it, uh, because in the in the case of the left, uh, we are not uh, resolving spatially the disk so it might be a disk but i see it as a ring does it make sense because i do not spatially resolve it so you you only are seeing a, a part of the of the of the yes. disk let's say yes, it's so yes but that sometimes this happens because you you are least only sensitive for example to a, yes. to a given region and then it looks like, and, uh, like it's, it's very nice if you think about it because you see it also in the displacements when you <laughs> take the time because here i see uh the blue and the red and, and zero. So this is what it happens when you see a ring. Uh, you have uh, blue shifted, uh, spring red shifted, and then in this direction zero. And uh, in the disk, uh, you see the uh, other way around. So maximum velocity is towards the center because you, you are seeing it because of Clepeian rotation, and then uh, uh, lower velocities towards the sizes. Yes. Okay. And so I, I just have a comment in, in one of your first uh, slides you show a comparison of the of the beam size of alma and uh, the other beam size of gravity and things yes. i i think you uh 
uh, the result for Alma is not is not uh, very good. Uh, it, well, it I, I didn't try with a compact uh, <laughs> configuration at uh, uh, a I long think, uh, wavelength because you you plotted the ring for a distance of 120 parsec. I think of the order of 50 uh, AUs or so. So uh, with the long baseline configuration of Alma, you can get only a couple of AUs a ring uh, like okay. this. So we obtain yeah, this kind of rings. In, I guess that's now. With, I guess that now with the long configuration of Alma, you can go down to five or something like that yeah like a couple of a u you can okay. you can you can I go at the page. order of one a u so i, I think it's an old plot it's, yes, it's, it's, it's a very it old before plot. alma was operative yes and the full time yeah or the full configuration yes it's very old uh, a very old slide actually yes <laughs> okay thank you very much Rainer, are you are mute. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Maida. No, I, I saw, I've seen a raised hand by Anton, but it's not raised anymore, so. Yeah, it was the same question as Guillaume was asking, exactly uh, the same. In the fact, radio uh, people. Just, just a comment to Rebecca. What I see also is that, uh, as you have suggested, in the left case, that is more compact. Hmm? Yes. And then it could give the explanation for that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I do not see the, the disc. It may be a disc, but I just see a ring. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, uh, we are missing. We need another. We need an AT. Yeah. We need a, another AT uh, at a longer, a longer baselines. <laughs> you always need bigger telescopes. Well, not big a telescope, but another one farther away. Maybe an oh, Armasaurus, they can put an, another AT <laughs> and give us the longest baseline. Yeah. Um, any more questions? So I, I had a couple more, but I don't know if I can ask. If how it's... Can. No, how it's many... for me, it's fine. <laughs> you mentioned a paper by Laman to be submitted very soon but it was not clear for me it was for the case of high mass intermediate or low mass protostar in particular for which density Claman uh, you have shown uh, ah, Claman Lucia I don't know how to pronounce yeah. can you show again this slide uh, I do not know where, where, uh, whether it has been accepted. Um, I, I mentioned so, submitted it and they were uh, in the process of uh, referring it. And I do not exactly know where it happens because unfortunately Lucia left uh, astrophysics. So I'm not, I'm not oh. sure. Yeah. <laughs> but my, my question regarding this war. Uh, and if not, uh, is the thesis of, of Lucia that is in, uh, what it was in, in Leiden, uh, is, is public. So uh, one can, can go, and uh, if you look, I think, in the ADS, you will find the thesis. OK, great. Um, we, we also think that CO over stone emission detected in infrared was uh, due to the accretion process. But now, the, with the high angular resolution of the gravity data, you are able to, to discriminate between possible models and favor magnetohydrodynamic winds. Yeah, you, you are you are talking about the bracket gamma. The, ah, both, about both, no? CO and bracket gamma. No, the, 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 the CO cannot come from the uh, magnetospheric accretion. Is, I think it will be dissociated. In, uh, what we see in uh, all the sources uh, that we have observed with ECO, but uh, that's, um, it has been also shown with uh, high spectral resolution when they model the single J components of the CO, uh, you, you need them to come very close to the, to the central source. And uh, actually with gravity, we see that in all the cases, uh, they come from, the, uh, from a region that is within the continuum emission, also for the high mass uh, YSOs. Yeah, so uh, we are wondering how it's possible. Um, and so we are collaborating with uh, David uh, Hollenbach and uh, Uma Gorty. They have almost a model 
uh, ready to try to explain the uh, the presence of, of the CO in, in, the, in the inner disk. So they have done a full thermochemistry model with the energy balance and, and everything, yeah. I know the whole... Very complicated. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, my, my last, last question... You are Short one, please. <laughs> you are focused only in sublimation process for explaining the inner radius, but as you know, uh, it could be the presence of tile that integration between binaries and weak planets, and this all can also truncate the inner this radius. Yes. Can you discriminate in? in uh, we in we radius? tried we tried to avoid uh, avoid binary the binary so, so the closed binaries. So we tried to avoid them, uh, but uh, some members of, of the group uh, like uh, the <laughs> binary disks and and the in the disk interaction. So we have uh, some. Um, I do not think uh, they can see much difference because in the K-bands uh, we are observing um, small dust grains and the small dust grains will be just uh, dragging uh, by the accretion process itself. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we will be able to see that with uh, gravity, maybe people in Matisse uh, with bigger dust grains that you know they will not be dragged so easily with the gas, they might see some difference. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so it's getting late now. So I think this was a wonderful talk, a lot of information. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Thanks a lot. Great talk. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And um, I insist on the invitation for next October that I will send to you by email in order that you please okay. check the dates. And um, you, I mean, we will be okay. happy Thank you. to have you here if possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.